Hello, and welcome to the Sharing Evidence and Results module. In this module, we will discuss the dissemination of your project results in the form of poster and podium presentations, as well as publications. The objectives will be to articulate the goals and benefits of evidence dissemination to your selected audience, describe the ways in which you can share your evidence with others, define the steps and consideration in preparing for poster and podium presentations, and to articulate considerations in the publication process. Now that you have completed your practice change, it's time to share what you learned with a larger audience. Your work deserves to be known outside of your health department or agency. Dissemination is the target distribution of information and intervention materials to a specific public health or clinical practice audience. The intent is to spread knowledge to improve patient outcomes. Brownson et al. describes that while researchers value dissemination and many funding agencies now require a plan that outlines dissemination among non-academic audiences, specific guidance on how best to accomplish effective dissemination is lacking. Dissemination is the targeted distribution of information and intervention materials to a specific public health or clinical practice audience. The intent is to spread knowledge to improve patient outcomes. Specifically, a dissemination plan explains why, the purpose for dissemination, what, the message to be disseminated, to whom, the audience, how, the method, and when, the timing of dissemination. The dissemination strategy should be based on an understanding of stakeholders and their information needs and preferences. A stakeholder is anyone who has a vested interest in the project or will be affected by the outcome. You need to involve these stakeholders from the very beginning of your project. You'll need support from leaders in your area and the organization has facilitators for the project. These could be supervisors, managers, or directors of departments involved. It could be community partners, organizations, and residents. They can assist you in seeking the resources and approval that you will need as you proceed through your project. It is important to approach these persons with your ideas and evidence before you begin implementation. Go to them ready to share a solid evidence-based benefits and barriers plan to implementing your idea. Per Bronson, dissemination efforts need to take into account the message, source, audience, and channel. Practitioners and policymakers can be more effectively reached via news media, social media, issue or policy briefs, one-on-one -on -one meetings, workshops, and seminars. According to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, evidence dissemination has several very broad goals. To increase the reach of evidence, how do we get it into the hands of public health professionals? To increase people's motivation to use and apply evidence, why is this evidence important for our communities? And to increase people's ability to use and apply evidence by overcoming any barriers or challenges that may exist to using this evidence in community and clinical settings. While there are a wide variety of ways to share evidence, it is important to select the right ones to get your message to your intended audience and to achieve your purpose. The message should be clear, use language appropriate for your audience, and use non-technical language where possible. It should be targeted. The message should be tailored to the specific audience you're trying to reach. Consider what they know and why your information is important to them. It should be actionable. What implications will your information have on the audience? How will they apply this to practice? And what are your future recommendations? It should be able to be repeated and it should be factually correct and the results meet both standards of reliability and validity. Consider how your stakeholders communicate information. Are there ways to use these same methods to communicate your findings? 
Consider how your stakeholders communicate information. Are there ways to use these same methods to communicate your findings? Ways to share evidence may include newsletters, flyers, press releases, journal clubs, in services, book reviews, expert opinions, radio TV interviews, social media, journal articles, case reports, case studies, policy briefs, book chapters, conference presentations, both podium and poster, professional meetings, workshops, and webinars. Gatewood et al. discusses the use of blogs and social media networking sites as dynamic, cost-effective communication tools with the potential to reach scientific, practitioner, and public audiences who may be missed through traditional outlets. Public health blogs create repositories of evidence-based research and information, such as infographics, podcasts, videos, articles, and tools that are freely and widely available to public and professional audiences around the globe. Blogs are cost-effective means by which to increase evidence-based information and help dispel misinformation. In a study conducted by McVeigh et al., the dissemination routes reported as being most commonly used by the respondents were academic journals, followed by academic conferences, reports issued to funders, press releases, seminars or workshops, face-to-face -face meetings with stakeholders, media interviews, newsletters, and other conferences. What are the advantages to using an evidence-based public health process? Foremost, the higher likelihood of success when decisions are based on evidence rather than historical, political, or other pressures. Common indicators of success can be identified and used to evaluate our own projects. New knowledge is generated. Existing programs can be defended and expanded by providing evidence to support them. Evidence can be used to advocate for new programs. A primary reason for conducting and then reporting on evaluation is to show your peers, managers, and administration what the program has achieved. A goal of sharing evidence is to encourage action. Action can take the form of incorporating a change across the organization. Benefits of evidence dissemination include raise awareness about the problem or issue, expand your personal knowledge of the subject matter, Benefit your colleagues and agency through personal and professional leadership growth and development of new policies and programs. Direct impact on patient outcomes. Improved departmental efficiencies. Enhance the reputation of your unit, agency, academic program. And finally, it can lead to personal merit and accolades. As you learned previously, evidence-based public health is the process of systematically finding, appraising, and using clinical and community research findings as the basis for decisions in public health. According to McVeigh et al., barriers to the dissemination of public health evidence can include organizational factors such as lack of time, money, and academic incentive, as well as individual factors, such as uncertainty on how best to disseminate findings or which organizations to target. Additional barriers include individual lack of the basic knowledge and skills required to assimilate evidence-based practices, job burnout that negatively affects interest in new and innovative practices, organizational barriers such as inadequate leadership support, a change averse culture, insufficient collegial support, and bureaucratic constraints that hinder efforts to implement and maintain such practices can also be barriers to the process. While the process of disseminating your findings might seem overwhelming, it truly doesn't have to be. Here are several strategies for getting started. You could start with a staff meeting presentation or internal agency newsletter. Make an outline or just start by writing individual thoughts you want to include on a page or under headers in an outline. Capitalize on student faculty collaborations and academic practice partnerships 
with nearby colleges or universities to gain access to evidence-based databases for data and information, as well as work with community agencies or nearby colleges or public librarians to assist you in these searches. Write about something you are passionate about. Write with a group to share writing tasks and responsibilities and write with an experienced writer or mentor. Start with a title and work from there. Review the literature, set up a table to sort, organize, and synthesize all of the evidence that you locate. What are your methods? What do you want to change and how? Schedule a time for writing, even if it's just 30 minutes a day. Think about conducting a poster presentation and then build towards podium presentations and manuscripts. Next, consider writing for a small, manageable publication. It could be a book review, an opinion letter, clinical procedure, case study, or any other editorial or initial opportunity for publishing. Staff meetings are prime opportunities to engage in evidence-based practice discussions. Consider reserving time on each agenda for discussing current issues, concerns, and overall needs around which evidentiary searches can occur. Journal clubs are meetings where public health professionals can gather to discuss the latest available evidence. These are ideal when seeking to keep employees aware of the latest evidence and improve your ability to critically evaluate published research. They create a community of practice and provide a structured social venue to learn from each other, to stay current, and to debate the evidence. They improve presentations, writing, and communication skills, and support magnet designation. Challenges can include staff time and attendance, article selection, lack of interest and motivation, lack of administrative support, and fear in sharing personal views. Aronson provides five reasons for running a journal club. To highlight new findings, to teach practitioners how to search for interesting articles representing the best evidence to inform clinical practice, to encourage practitioners to read and appraise publications critically and give them the ability to do so, to encourage practitioners to do applied clinical research and to show them how and to improve debating skills, demonstrate leadership skills, and aid peer mentorship. Aronson also offers suggestions for running journal club meetings. These include involving everyone with a common interest in the topics for discussion. Additionally, consider leadership and those empowered to make decisions on applying evidence to practice. Run the club regularly at the same time on the same day of the week so that it becomes a fixture for all involved. Have at least one designated skilled leader who regularly participates in the club. Ensure that the meetings start and end on time. Encourage commonality by asking everyone at the start of each meeting to give their name and a piece of information about themselves. Discuss up to three papers from peer-reviewed journals. Develop a theme each time. Occasionally include books of interest. Keep notes and provide free enticing refreshments. Make the interactions fun for all. Dahabi and Lauer from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health have created a list of tips for presenters that begins with selecting an article. They recommend considering articles on topics of interest to you that will generate conversation. Once you've narrowed down the pool of options to a few articles, you might ask yourself, was a new association, positive or negative, or novel method presented? Did the results contradict previous knowledge? Did the study make a major public health impact? Were many critical letters written to the editor in response to it? The next step in the process is reading the article with a critical eye on the study design and methods and the ability to reproduce these methods and results in your institution. Selected members should present the findings of their literature review at the journal club meeting. 
Consider the use of handouts to the advantage and disadvantages of implementation of each presented article. Regarding article content, members should rotate presenters of content to assure full participation and engagement of all involved. Engage in thoughtful discussion with all members and leaders. Finally, summarize the discussion and determination of the selected evidence-based application to address your presented concern. In addition, educational in-services or lunch and learns provide an opportunity for short bursts of information and sharing to improve practice and positively impact patient outcomes. Librarians, academic partners, professional colleagues, and professional organizations are valuable mentors. Look for someone that can assist you. If not in your workplace, then maybe a connection from a professional organization can provide the level of support that you will need towards achieving your practice and evidence-based sharing objectives. The abstract clearly describes both the nature and significance of the clinical issue. It involves simply copying or refining the information you have already gathered in your change process. It should present the findings using statistical information. Abstracts are typically limited to 200 to 300 words, leaving just a sentence or two per section to address the following questions related to your project. What is the clinical issue? What is the population focus? What is the setting? Who are the key stakeholders? What is the significance of this issue to this population? And what was the specific aim or purpose of the project? Followed by, how does your project contribute to improving population outcomes and or systems? The abstract includes a statement of evidence, articles you found that support your practice change, quality improvement initiative or process. It may include published national clinical evidence-based practice guidelines. This summary of supporting literature must describe how your project offers a solution to the identified problem. Project implementation describes the activities, strategies, approaches, and processes involved in the implementation of the project. It may include the framework and or evidence-based practice model, if applicable, that guided your project design. What tools were used? For example, did you use a survey perhaps? What challenges or barriers did you face? The outcome sentence is a concise description of the evaluation method for your project. What criteria for the evaluation process were chosen? Think about cost analysis, QI methodology, survey, or data extracted from chart reviews. It provides a clear description of the outcomes of the intervention or process. What were the clinical implications for practice? What are your recommendations for next steps in the process? The abstract ends with a one to two sentence summary statement of your project aims and findings. It is appropriate to use abbreviations for frequently referenced institutions, organizations, words, or phrases. However, remember you must spell them out the first time used for the reader. The abstract includes a statement of evidence the articles you found that support your practice change, quality improvement initiative or process. It may include published national clinical evidence-based guidelines. The summary of supporting literature must describe how your project offers a solution to the identified problem. Project implementation describes the activities, strategies, approaches, and processes involved in implementation of the project. It may include the framework and or evidence-based practice model that guided your project design. What tools were used? For example, again, did you use a survey perhaps? And again, what challenges or barriers did you face? Conferences give public health professionals the opportunity to explore new information about their area of specialty through presentation, 
to meet and discuss ideas with speakers and authors directly, to accumulate continuing education units, and to present an abstract as an individual or team on quality improvement or practice changes you have implemented or research you have conducted. Tips for finding a conference to present your work include joining your professional association or specialty association. For example, the American Public Health Association, or perhaps the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, which is an organization of member states and territories that represent public health epidemiologists. NASHO, the National Association of County and City Health Officials. This organization is the comprehensive representative body for more than 2,700 local health departments in the US. You might even consider joining the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. It is the largest nonprofit group in the US for representing public health agencies in the country. In your region, look to connect with county boards of health or tribal organizations and review your county's local assessment of needs. You may also review your hospital's community needs assessment. You might also search websites for public health conferences. You may search the internet using keywords related to your specialty practice area, such as public health and epidemiologist, or public health and health educator, and the word conference. Finally, you might monitor for calls for abstracts for conferences through email, public health publications, and websites. Posters are widely used at conferences to summarize information regarding quality improvement or research concisely and attractively to draw interest and generate discussion. You may need to be selective and check with leaders up front on cost. Smaller organizations may have limited budgets for travel and registration costs. Even larger ones right now are being selective financially. The clinician may have the opportunity to stand by the poster display while other participants can come and view the presentation and interact with the author. You may also need to interact virtually or by email or phone. In the next several slides, we will discuss aspects of the poster in detail to assist you in the creation of your poster and to prepare you to tackle and successfully conquer the poster presentation. Scientific posters are an effective way to highlight and share your scholarship or quality improvement project findings with colleagues, peers, academic institutions, and clinical agencies. The poster tells the audience a story about your work from the background that identified the problem to the actions you took to address it and the results. The process of creating a scientific poster can be challenging and time consuming. The first step begins with choosing a poster PowerPoint template that best meets the criteria for the conference parameters for size and layout you have been given once your abstract has been accepted. A typical poster size is 48 inches by 36 inches landscaped orientation with the slides separated into three or four columns. The poster is divided into sections and is read from top to bottom and left to right. These sections include the introduction, background, purpose or PICO, which as you learned before stands for Population Intervention Comparison and Outcome. This section will also cover your project aims and objectives. You should also provide a bulleted point or two that demonstrates what was learned from the review of the literature. The methods and outcome section references your sample or population. Intervention, results, and analysis and an evaluation design. Finally, the poster should provide details on your future recommendations or next steps, public health implications, and should summarize your findings in a conclusion statement. Lastly, if you have anyone to recognize for support or contributions to your project outside of the formal authors, these individuals may be recognized in the acknowledgements. 
You would also use this section to state any funding you have received for this project or thank those who provided equipment or services to make the project possible. We have provided free poster templates to assist you, as well as a video and tutorial on how to create a PowerPoint slide on the sharing evidence page on the Nursing Experts Translating the Evidence site, should you not prefer any of these free templates. Hello again, we have provided a link to an engaging and informative video series by Dr. Judy Godsey, an Assistant Professor of Nursing at Northern Kentucky University and Director of the Northern Kentucky Nursing Research Collaborative. In addition, we have provided a handout of hints and tips for creating the best poster by Dr. Julie Zerwick on our sharing evidence page on the next site. A few key points from Dr. Zerwick's presentation and her and her fellow authors publication include, organize the content to be read left to right and from top to bottom in each column. Use the zoom function on PowerPoint to increase the size of the slide for better viewing as you construct. PowerPoint has a grid and guides tool under the view menu that will superimpose lines that can be used to assure that objects are aligned correctly. Putting uniform spacing before and or after particular levels of headings allows viewers to recognize that an important element is coming up. Underlying text is visually too mild to command attention. Bolding, tinting, or enlarging text works better. Use no distracting fonts and only those that are easily able to be read from far distances. No script, font size no smaller than 24 point, use the same font throughout to avoid distraction. You should be able to read the font three to four feet away. Use color for contrast, but be careful to not be distracting. Use charts, tables, figures, graphs, and pictures to help explain your results. Limit horizontal lines to 10 words. Use text boxes to insert keywords or images. Check your images for resolution to be sure they won't fade or become blurry or distorted when enlarged. Run spell check when complete and allow one week for poster printing. Here is a sample poster. You will see the first column describes the problem, background statistics, information about the location. This could be the county or geographic location or perhaps hospital or clinical agency. The second column states the clinical question and methods or actions that you're taking to address the problem as well as what measures or outcomes you will track or tools you will use to know if your action has made a difference. The third column details the results or evaluation of your outcomes. The final column highlights the nursing or patient care implications or public health implications of your action, as well as recommendations or next steps for future actions and your conclusion. Poster presentations can take place in large conference spaces where you are among a group of 100 or other presenters to more intimate settings where you may be a group of four or five or perhaps 10 presenters in a 60 or 90 minute session. Having handouts of the presented poster PowerPoint slide, as well as your references is recommended to provide to attendees of your presentation. In addition, list your contact information for attendees who may want to network with you after the meeting. Participants to your presentation will be asking you to inform them about your project focus, implementation, outcomes and plans for sustainability. They will typically spend three to five minutes at your poster. Some questions to consider are, why did you or the facility select this intervention for the problem? Did the evidence in the literature justify the selected intervention as the best intervention for this problem and why? Who are the key stakeholders who care about this problem? What was your role in shaping the project? Was the intervention delivered as originally planned? What were the challenges? What process did you consider to evaluate your initiative? 
Were there any unintended or unexpected outcomes? And what were the clinical implications, next steps, or recommendations for moving forward? Here's an example of a completed poster. As you prepare for your poster presentation, remember to be open and engaging. Smile, be personable, maintain eye contact. Know that no one is more of an expert about this very project at your setting with the population you used than you. Thus, speak clearly, competently, and confidently about your work. As individuals come to your poster, thank them for stopping, introduce yourself, and ask them their name and where they might be from. Then begin a conversation about your project with, as you may be aware, or we were interested to learn that, or we discovered. Engage in a dialogue and walk them through your poster. At the end, thank them for their time. This will go quite quickly, so prepare a brief summary, sort of an elevator speech about your project, hitting the highlights in the average three minute time frame. Practice with friends and family members as attendees. It is good to practice with peers and laypersons to assure what you're saying is easily understood by all potential attendees. Most importantly, remember to have fun. This is a fantastic honor to have been selected to present. So enjoy yourself and congratulations for having your hard work recognized. Podium presentations are excellent formats for delivering information about your project to a targeted audience of your peers, patients, or other intended populations. You might present at a staff or council meeting or at a conference situation. Over the next few slides, we will cover tips to consider for creating and delivering your PowerPoint presentation. Podium presentation design begins with an introduction that explains the problem you sought to address and grabs the attention of your audience. Podium presentations are typically 10 to 15 minutes in length. Prepare yourself to start and end on time. General rule of thumb is one minute per one slide. Most individuals use Microsoft Office PowerPoint to create slides for their presentation. However, if you're comfortable with other formats, you may choose to use Prezi or Google Slides or another type of software. Please see the sharing evidence page for a handout covering the podium design and presentation. Use the notes feature at the bottom of each slide to create your narrative, what you want to add for details to each of your bulleted points on the slide. In addition, for recorded presentations, familiarize yourself with the recording narration feature in PowerPoint. We have provided two references on the sharing evidence page of the Nursing Experts Translating Evidence site to assist you. When speaking in public, things you need to consider for a successful presentation include, arrive early to get comfortable with the room layout and take a few deep breaths to alleviate any anxiety you might be feeling. This will also allow you time to meet the moderator and to test your slides with the provided audiovisual equipment. Dress comfortably but professionally in business attire. Make eye contact with and always face your audience. Don't read your presentation directly from the slides. Practice, practice, practice. The more that you practice delivering your content, the more confident you will become and less likely that you will need to rely on your notes and thus you'll be more engaged with the intended audience and will be more likely to keep their attention. At the end of your presentation, thank your audience for their attendance. Now comes the often dreaded Q&A, question and answer session. The frame for questions can vary from a few minutes to 10 minutes. Think about our discussion for the poster Q&A. Be prepared, anticipate the questions you might receive and practice your responses. Please see the handout on the sharing evidence page on the website for more information on design, presentation, and the Q&A session. Preparing a manuscript for publication can be an exhilarating process. The opportunity to share your knowledge and experiences, 
to have your voice heard, to impact practice in other agencies across the country and perhaps the globe is incredibly inspiring. According to Orem and Hayes, five main reasons to write for publication include the opportunity to share ideas and expertise with other professionals, to disseminate evidence in the findings of research studies, for promotion, tenure, and other personnel decisions, for development of your own personal knowledge and skills, for clinical ladder advancement, promotion, or progression, and for personal satisfaction. Many public health professionals are engaged currently in evidence-based practice projects. The outcomes of these projects are essential to building the knowledge base of your profession. Writing gives the public health professional a sense of personal satisfaction in sharing expertise with other public health professionals and contributing to the development of your profession. Many public health professionals are engaged currently in evidence-based practice projects. The outcomes of these projects are essential to building the knowledge base of public health practice. Writing gives the public health professional a sense of personal satisfaction in sharing expertise with other professionals and contributing to the development of your specialty. In the next several slides, we will discuss the steps in the writing process from choosing a journal and submitting a query to preparing the publication. Quantitative quality improvement or research papers typically include an introduction, methods, results, and discussion section. In addition, we will discuss aims and objectives, the literature review, recommendations, and the conclusion. Journal selection can be a daunting task. Thousands of scientific journals exist. Currently, there are more than 500 national and international public health journals listed by Scopus. It is important to choose a journal tailored to the audience you are trying to reach and one that will best highlight your work. There are several points to consider when choosing a journal for publication. First, does your health department or community agency have an agency newsletter? How about your professional association? What about a human interest piece for your local newspaper? Not all publications have to be research studies or quality improvement projects. Think about collaborating with others in your field on a book chapter, offering your expert opinion or commentary, publishing a case study, a human interest story, or perhaps a poem. Next, assess your literature review for journals you cited who published evidence similar to your project topic. It is likely that those journals may also be interested in your work. Review the aims of the journal and author submission guidelines on their website. Read the latest publications. Are they in line with your submission? Who is their audience? Does this align with your target population? What type of articles do they accept? What type of format will they use, APA or MLA, for example? What is the required word count or word count limitations? Is there a word count like 5,000 words that you must stay under? Microsoft Word has a built-in word count calculator to assist you. Does the journal use peer review? In essence, will your scholarship be viewed by leaders in your specialty field of practice, thus promoting a critical analysis of your work and others to prevent issues with validity and minimize bias? What is the time from submission to decision? Carefully selecting the journal in which you submit your manuscript greatly reduces the risk of rejection of your work. The important thing is just to start. You can do it. Predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. It is important to evaluate any journal you are considering for submission. The first step is to check the journal's website. Look at the journal's editorial board. It should be made up of recognized experts in the field. 
check if the board members also list their editorial board membership on their own websites or CVs. Predatory journals often falsely claim that recognizable scholars are members of their editorial board to appear legitimate. The next step is to research the editor-in-chief. Can you find them on a university webpage or on LinkedIn? Is this the only journal that they edit or do they also edit multiple journals across several disciplines? Predatory publishers often list the same editor-in-chief for multiple journals. The journal website should also mention who the publisher is and include a description of the peer review process. Most predatory journals are not peer reviewed or promise an impossibly fast review period. Finally, look for information about fees. Does the website explain what fees authors will be charged and why? Credible journals don't usually charge a submission fee. Another way to assess a journal's quality is to read multiple issues of the journal. Evaluate the quality of the studies they publish and check for obvious copying editing errors. Ask yourself if all the studies are relevant to the journal's mission. Check out the publisher. Check if the journal's articles are indexed on PubMed. If the articles aren't indexed, you don't want to publish in the journal as your research will be effectively lost. Per Grutenwitz, predatory journals accept articles for publication along with author's fees without performing promised quality checks for issues such as plagiarism or ethical approval. A link to the Think Check Submit site to assess potential predatory journals is listed here. Justin Moore, Associate Editor of the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, provides a series of tutorials explaining how to prepare a manuscript for publication. In addition, you may find the Stanford Nurse Alumni Series of nine research education modules for frontline clinical staff helpful. Module 9, a tutorial on how to prepare a manuscript, provides a nice introduction to preparing the publication. The title of a manuscript gives the first impression about the manuscript. The title should be clear and concise and describe the work while piquing the interest of the reader. It needs to capture the topic of your project and the key messages you wish to convey to the audience. It is important that you identify all authors who contributed to your work through design, implementation, and writing, and include their names, credentials, and work or academic institutions. A query letter is an opportunity to determine if the journal or journals you've chosen to submit to have an interest in your topic. In a brief email, state your topic, summarize your project findings, and tell the author a bit about your clinical affiliation and credentials. In essence, you are pitching your idea to the editor to gauge interest in your topic. Per Nance and Britt, this letter articulates your goals and desired outcomes. Usually, you'll receive a timely response. The response might give you a deadline for submission or it might guide you to move in a different direction. The introduction and background are two distinct sections of the paper. The introduction sets the tone of the article. It introduces the reader to your topic and needs to capture their attention and compel the reader to continue their review of your manuscript. The introduction needs to tell the reader why the study is important and what is the urgency, why is this issue so critical. The background provides the details, the statistics, and supportive evidence. What is the purpose of your study? What compelled you to address this issue at this point in time? What can you tell the reader about your clinical agency and population? What issues and events led to this study? The background section ends with a description of the aims of your study, essentially what are your goals? What do you intend to achieve? For example, we aim to assess the feasibility of a text messaging education intervention to address risky sexual behaviors compared to face-to-face -face instruction, or we aim to examine sexual health knowledge retention among adolescents following a social media educational intervention. As you learned in previous modules, the literature review summarizes the available evidence or current knowledge surrounding your topic. Per Rausch, a review of the literature is an examination of what is known about this topic as it relates to your purpose. 
Articles should be evaluated for their relevance to your current topic and proposed intervention. Once you have narrowed your list to those specific to your topic, you should then proceed with writing the literature narrative. What were the findings in these articles? The challenges? The limitations? What were the common themes? What conclusions did these authors come to? What methods, strategies, or interventions did they employ? What gaps did you identify? In other words, what remains unknown where little supportive evidence exists? In what ways do you support or refute their hypothesis and interventions? The literature review should synthesize these concepts and answer these questions in a concise way. Don't describe studies one by one when synthesizing. Pull out related information from different studies, integrate it, and tell the reader what it means. The main purpose of the methodology section is to describe the design, outcomes, measures, or interventions, and evaluation process that you used in completing your project. What type of a design did you utilize? Descriptive, case study, cohort, case control, or perhaps a randomized controlled trial? Or did you complete a quality improvement study? What were your variables? Describe your analysis. Did you use descriptive statistics to measure the frequency of your variables? How did you collect, store, and protect your data? What internal reviews processes were conducted, such as an institutional review board approval? Did you use human subjects? If so, what was your process for identification, recruitment, and informed consent? What was your inclusion and exclusion criteria for your sample? What was the setting for your study or quality improvement project? Did you use a survey, tool, equipment of any kind? If so, you would describe these here as well as the validity and reliability of these instruments. A good rule is to review how other articles have stated their design and methodology to find a format for this articulation that best fits your manuscript. In the results section, you will state your findings. This section begins with a description of your population, discussion of the demographics you collected, for example, age, gender, race, ethnicity, years of service, or perhaps years of education, symptomology of your clients, or presentation. Authors typically use tables, graphs, or figures to demonstrate their numerical findings. Do not interpret or make any conclusions regarding the data. That will occur in your discussion section. The discussion section is where you will clarify your results and make inferences about their meaning and significance. In the discussion, you present how your results or findings compare to the studies you discussed in your literature review, as well as the relationship between your results and the impact on your population. For example, did one demographic group perform better or worse? If so, why? Here is where you discuss those key points and contemplate why they exist using the supportive evidence from your lit review as your guide. Discuss any unexpected results and provide some explanation for why they occurred. Discuss the public health implications of your findings. What were the patient outcomes or client outcomes? Did you track satisfaction among users? What were the limitations and what challenges or barriers did you experience? The recommendation section is your opportunity to tell the reader about next steps for your project. It is also an opportunity to tell the reader that the steps you hope future researchers will take in building upon your findings. What might you have done differently knowing what you know now? It is an opportunity to suggest how you might overcome any previously disclosed limitations. Per Rausch, the conclusion is your opportunity to leave the reader with a strong message. The conclusion should summarize your key findings in relationship to achieving your previously stated aims. It should end with a summary statement that once again highlights the significance of your work. Prior to considering submission, show your article to colleagues and ask them to provide a critique to improve your manuscript. Are there questions they have that may have been left unanswered that you could go back and address prior to submission to your chosen journal? After you have reviewed available journals, submitted your query letter, 
and chosen a journal to submit your manuscript to, the next step is to go back and reread the author guidelines and assure your manuscript follows this criteria. Per Rausch, author guidelines include specific instructions on how to prepare manuscripts for submission, including formatting style and word count. One of the most common mistakes authors make is not following author guidelines, which greatly diminishes the chance that their manuscript will be accepted. Most journals will not even review manuscripts that do not meet their guidelines. Select a corresponding author among your team who will submit the manuscript and communicate with the journal editor. This is typically your first author. You would next develop a cover letter to the editor to send along with the manuscript that describes the title, content, and urgency or significance of the project. Finally, your authors will be required to complete conflict of interest statements. These COIs require you to disclose financial interest in the project or other potential biases that may have an impact on the validity of your study results. Once your manuscript is accepted, it will be reviewed by peers and typically the editor or members of the journal editor review board. This process can take weeks or even months. Three potential outcomes of the review are revision, rejection, and acceptance. It is completely unheard of to have the journal accept the manuscript as is, so expect either revisions or a rejection. Revisions are a good thing. It means the reviewers are interested and will most likely provide you a blueprint for improving your work prior to publication. Per Rausch, don't be surprised if your initial reaction to reviewers' comments is defensive. As writers, we can feel vulnerable about our creation, and it's difficult to read criticism of something you've worked so very hard on. If you try to depersonalize the comments and set them aside for a short while, by the time you come back to them, you may have a more constructive perspective. That doesn't mean you'll agree with every recommendation, but that's okay. Take them step by step and be sure to address each one and thank the authors for their review. You will compose revisions with track changes and provide a revision table that details what was suggested by the reviewers in one column and how you addressed it in another. This will be returned with your revised manuscript. If you choose not to make a change, provide a clear rationale for this decision. If you receive a rejection, do not feel defeated. This is very common. You are in good company. The average rejection rate for biomedical journals is 62%, with some as high as 95%. Per Rouse, reasons why a manuscript may not be accepted can include not a good fit with the journal audience, not seen as a new significant contribution to existing evidence, lacking interest, lacks supportive evidence or evidence is not from recent credible sources, or lacks citation, lacks synthesis, is poorly written, rhetoric or biased, fatal flaws such as problems with the study design or analysis, ethical problems, plagiarism and bias, and doesn't follow the author guidelines. Of course, the outcome we all hope to see is acceptance. After revisions have been accepted, authors are notified of when and how, typically in print and electronic form, their scholarship will be published. Savor the moment. Reflect on this accomplishment. Congratulations on producing a work that will be shared with others and has the potential to impact many individuals for years to come. These next few slides contain our references and image credits. We want to thank you for the opportunity to present this work to you today. We do hope that you are encouraged to now share your evidence and disseminate to larger populations. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.